Yeah, and I think um, you were really able to pull that out of Randall and also the other uh, families, even under that tight deadline, because you had that perspective and the historical context. And it's really, I mean, it's hard for me to overstate how big of a feat that was for you, for journalism, journalistically, to be able to draw that out given all of the complexities that were uh, surfacing right around that time of, you know, the really internalized, uh, you know, perceptions of Asian American women that were surfacing. But I also want to turn to a, a, d a different story and then take a Twitter, qu Twitter question. I want to ask you about Vilma Carey, the Filipino American woman who was brutally attacked while she was on her way to church in Manhattan. And she was shouted out with racial expletive as well. And this was one of the many stories that you had covered relating to anti-Asian violence. And Vilma turned the assault into something that is empowering for the AAPA community. And I know that this interview was not the easiest for you to secure, but it also ended up being very memorable for you. So tell us about um, that story and then what you took away from that experience about how the AAPI community should be responding to this ongoing anti-Asian hate and violence. Um, Vilma Carey is such a heroine to me. Um, she's a Filipina American um, and she, you know, the hallmark of, of her attack, sadly, was that it was captured on surveillance camera and there were uh, there were scenes of lobby personnel closing the doors as the attack was going on and on the sidewalk in front. And, you know, we spoke to the building and they said, oh, that tape was taken out of context, you know, et cetera, et cetera. There's more to the story. So we left it at that. But but what her attack showed was the intersectionality of so many issues that happen in so many of these attacks, right? Um, she was attacked by a man who had um, just been released from prison for killing his own mother, who had a long history of mental illness and was having a, a psychotic break. Um, he punched her, shoved her, uh, kicked her. She broke a hip. Her pelvis was broken. Um, she had uh, head injuries. Um, and he said something to her at the time, something like, you know, you Asian blank blank, uh, you don't belong here. And her daughter is an accomplished professional and her daughter uh, decided to, her name is Liz, decided to um, take that expletive and take some of the GoFundMe money that they received in the wake of the attack and empower um that what happened and and turned victimhood into something powerful so she collected stories of belonging from the asian american community and they had a pop-up museum in the museum of china uh, chinese in america and they put up beautiful art and turned it into an organization called aapi belong you know taking the attacker's words and turning it on its head but when i spoke to vilma finally after you know months of rehab and she was walking gingerly and she sat down and i said you know vilma you know i know you were headed to saint patrick's cathedral when you were attacked did you make it and she said yes i went and i, I said what did you pray for and she said i prayed for the with gratitude i prayed for so many people who prayed for healing, sent me notes of, of encouragement and, and healing and the food and the money and the this and the that. I was so grateful for the outpouring. And then she paused and she looked at her daughter who was sitting next to me. She looked at me and she goes, and then I prayed for my attacker. And I, I was telling you this last night, Michelle, but I mean, there are multiple cameras on this interview and I'm sure the camera on me captured this. Because I said, why did you do that, Vilma? And she said, um, because whatever was going on in his mind at the moment, I wanted to give him peace. And I thought, what an incredible gesture, right? So um, beautiful in literally fighting hate with love, but also in that moment, um, you know, talking about what is it in our culture that sends these unconscious messages to disordered minds. When somebody walks into a grocery store in Buffalo and kills a dozen African American people with hate in their disordered mind, what, where are those messages coming from and what can we do to combat that? In addition to that, you know, I said to her in real time, in the moment when I finally was able to close my jaw, I said, you know, Vilma, I've been doing this for 30 years and I know enough to know that whether you look at it from a faith perspective or a philosophical perspective or even a psychological perspective that what you did in that moment was more empowering to you 
as much as it was for the person who you were giving essentially grace um, and redemption. And I thought, you know, it was such a powerful example, both with her daughter and her, to, to turning this into something broader. Our, the second part of that piece was about the NYPD task force, because they sent a Tagalog speaking police officer, which is really difficult in so many of these attacks to either prove or even get a hate crimes charge, right? Because sometimes either the victims or the witnesses don't speak English enough. Um, to, to be able to file a police report, or they're afraid of authorities based on cultural, you know, uh, norms uh, from the old country, or um, there's a real sense that, like in in the Asian community, like keep your head down, don't complain, you know, um, and and also this idea that there's no like trigger word, right? There's no word that says, aha, that's an anti-Asian hate crime. Is mm -hmm. it enough to say, go back to your country? Is mm -hmm. it enough to say, you know, Kung flu? Is it enough to say, like, what is it? There's no trigger symbol. There's no swastika. There's no, you know, noose that immediately turns it into a hate crime. And so it's, right. it's elusive. And there are so many different challenges, is, you know, beyond a policing issue that, that needs to go into fighting this kind of hate.